Welcome to the third day of the ESCO conference and welcome to session F, special session on globalization and input output tables. Hope everyone's rearing to go on a Friday. Some very interesting topics being presented here. The three presenters we have this morning are Noriko for Yamano from the OECD, Jose Rueda Cantouche from the European Commission and Luke Weston from the Office for National Statistics. Many of you may know, but in case you don't know, I'm Sanjeev Mahajan, I'm chairing the session. I'm also from the Office for National Statistics in the UK. Each presentation, like in the previous two days, will be 20 minutes long. I'll give the presenters a five minute gentle nudge towards the end. We'll have a 10 minute question and answer session and then a collective question and answer towards the end. If you have any questions, please use the QA bar um, and then my able assistant will mute or unmute you as appropriate to ask the questions at the end of the, each of the presentations. The QA facility is there and it's very useful. So without further ado, we'll start with the first presentation from Nori from the OECD. I will mute and take myself off camera. And if Nori, um, uh, you can share your presentation, off you go. Okay, so I can start now. Yes, you can. Okay, thank you. So um, my name is Norihiko Yamano from OECD. Today I'd like to introduce our activities on the development of the trade and industry databases, uh, especially a global input output uh, database for globalization analysis. What I mean globalization here is mainly about the uh, international trade analysis. So, uh, so what we do at OECD, uh, first, of course, we will discuss about the international standards in the manuals on national accounts, trade statistics, and also some other uh, satellite accounts such as tourism and r um, In our uh, division, uh, in the work on the empirical side, so we um, collect the data sources from national uh, statistics agencies, um, estimate the harmonized uh, format, and the harmonizing also the classifications of those uh, uh, raw data. And then uh, we estimate the uh, development of the uh, models, indicators, and then, of course, we uh, disseminate the results. So to do that, uh, I summarize uh, some features of the data we use and also some uh, issues in uh, each data source. Like, uh, well, we can start from the national accounts. Uh, of course, a feature here is we can access to um, actually all countries, more than 200 countries easy to access from the, for example, United Nations or Eurostat data sources. And basically, it's a concept of very harmonized across countries. Um, however, there are some uh, issues, like some countries are still uh, using the uh, old uh, SNA system. And also, sometimes the variable are mixed, uh, basic prices and producer prices are mixed. And sometimes we see the countries published only in fiscal years, not in calendar years. So those are the something we still have to do a little bit harmonization in OECD. And then we can go to the merchandise trade statistics, such as uh, UN Comtrade. And the data is very useful in terms of the uh, data uh, product details. It's very timely. And also, sometimes we can get uh, frequency data, such as a monthly data, quarterly data. It's easy to access. And of course, uh, most uh, significant feature is we can access the um, bilateral trade flows. However, there are some issues if we really look into the details. 
uh, there are uh, many uh, asymmetry issues. Uh, the, the products are including second hand, re export, re import, and sometimes the bilateral flows could be uh, uh, distorted or they are uh, different from uh, the, what other partners are reporting uh, due to the uh, definition of the uh, partner uh, information, such as consignment, final destinations, and, or the true origin. And then uh, we also use uh, a balance of payment uh, to uh, complement the national accounts database. And the, uh, today's session is about uh, input output, so uh, we can discuss more about the national SUTs, IOTs. Of course, a major uh, uh, feature of those uh, tables, uh, we can access uh, a detailed information of product and industry transaction database, which is very useful, and we try to uh, use that in the globalization analysis for the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Um, of course, there are some uh, issues compared to the earlier data. Uh, still, not many countries are able to provide the annual tables and the uh, sector information are uh, we have to be, uh, I mean, yeah, it's not so uh, harmonized in terms of uh, sector classification, okay. And then uh, sometimes we use uh, other uh, data sources such as uh, employment, uh, carbon footprint. So those uh, informations can be also included in uh, our data with the uh, input output data. So from the, uh, these data sources, uh, we estimate the uh, global inter-country input system. That basically we try to solve all the issues we mentioned in above. So we can um, have the symmetric trade flows, the uh, concept of the barrier that uh, harmonizing basic prices, and the, we fill the gaps with the annual data. And of course, the sector classifications are uh, harmonized across countries. So um, before we go to this uh, input output database, um, I just want to mention about the conceptual differences of the uh, trade flows in uh, each database. So, so we get the frequently asked questions about what is the definition of the exports, imports, why is the, uh, our global intercountry IO, ICIO, uh, trade flows are different from the, the official data sources. The main reason is, of course, the, the differences in the basic price or purchase price concept. And sometimes uh, we have a more detailed questions like the um, bilateral trade uh, flows. So um, once we explain carefully to the uh, ordinary users, uh, they can understand why the, uh, the, the difference is uh, appears in the ICIO and the national sources. But also we sometimes think that the national sources are sometimes good. We have sometimes need to consider the trade balances in purchases price or FOB rather than uh, basic price in the product origin countries. So it's still uh, remaining issues, how we can present the uh, trade flows in the uh, inter-country IO system. So future issues. So using the uh, UK example to show the, uh, the uh, purchase price and basic price, uh, and also uh, we can understand the how the uh, National Statistic Office uh, presents the re-export or re-imports in the database. So fortunately, we can have the um, three concept of the uh, trade flows from the uh, SUT data, uh, SUT sources in the UK. So we can have a clear idea how they present 
uh, in the um, uh, data source. So that's an uh, ideal case. And also, uh, but unfortunately, we cannot get this uh, information for all countries. So uh, what we do uh, in here is to fill the gaps of uh, com connecting the uh, FOB, CIF, uh, purchase prices, basic prices, we export uh, in here. And uh, this is a summary for the bilateral relationship. Um, I can skip this. Um, of course, we can um, circulate uh, slides data. So please let me know if you're interested in this. So the, I think the, the most significant issues to uh, think about the bilateral uh, trade uh, differences asymmetries is a uh, treatment of the re-export. Uh, if we look at the official data, uh, we can have clear idea that this re-export is a big uh, issue in uh, many uh, countries. So um, now we go to the uh, development of the OECD ICI. So using the uh, official data sources in the left hand side, um, there is a um, intermediate analytical database uh, produced in here. So we um, uh, adjust some of the national accounts data sources, uh, SUTs, bilateral trade databases uh, in goods and services. And also uh, we estimate the, some other um, uh, sectoral uh, estimates, uh, we are just uh, implement uh, those things. So those are the things we do. Uh, also, we uh, publish the uh, intermediate products. Uh, for example, uh, we call the STAN database, a structural analysis database. Uh, it's also available from the OECD uh, data portal, as well as uh, uh, the other uh, official data sources in the, the circle in yellow in here, such as national accounts and currency payment. So uh, from the national accounts, uh, just uh, to uh, remind you that the structure of the export is uh, very different across uh, countries. I just put the OECD countries in here. Uh, some countries are just uh, UK, United States, um, Luxembourg, those countries have a uh, large export of uh, services. Um, some countries have um, uh, exports of uh, direct purchases, which is mainly uh, tourism, such as from uh, Greece and Portugal. So uh, it's important to include all of these uh, type of the, uh, exports. What we have to do is uh, simply uh, present uh, all these uh, components carefully in the I, uh, ICIO system. And that's actually our features in the uh, OECD ICIO database. And uh, this is to summarize the history of uh, multi country harmonized input databases. Uh, we've been uh, developing uh, this type of harmonized format input output data from the uh, mid 1990s uh, up to now. And two years ago, we are able to uh, publish the inter-country input system in new format, which is 2008 SNA format in the ISIC-4 industry classifications. And those are the uh, current standard in other uh, similar uh, input output, uh, global input output databases, such as uh, EU's uh, Figaro, ICIO, uh, WIO database, and ADB's MRIO data sources. And so we developed the uh, input output databases, but also we estimate the, uh, I mean, we uh, do some uh, analytical uh, applications with these uh, input output databases. So recently, uh, last two years, 
we are doing uh, some uh, sustainable defense goal uh, issues such as child labor, carbon footprint, uh, inequalities. And also we have some uh, applications on projection uh, model and, and a little bit about this is uh, COVID uh, pandemic uh, impact analysis. Of course, but the, the main uh, application in here is to use this uh, ICIO model to estimate uh, globalization indicators such as TIVA indicators and jobs embodied in, uh, uh, in trade flows. Nori? So, yes. You, you've still got quite a bit of time. You've got seven, eight minutes. Can you just speak a little louder or closer to the mic? I think some okay. people are struggling to hear you. Okay. okay. Sorry. Thank you. It's better. Um, so uh, the next uh, some more minutes, uh, I will uh, talk about the uh, features of the OCI data. So this is a, a long-term project. So we try to estimate the uh, new tables uh, um, about every uh, two years. So it's a long-term project. And basically, we try to present the uh, official uh, SUTs and IOTs in our system. And the, there are some other features that those are like uh, we have uh, uh, direct purchases uh, by non resident uh, direct purchases abroad. Those are uh, explicitly uh, available in here. And also, we try to estimate some. Uh, additional, it's really minor, but uh, it's about uh, to fill in the uh, gaps of the uh, GDP concept uh, in the uh, taxes paid by non residents. And also, we have a uh, farm heterogeneity within manufacturing indices that is uh, very important to capture the, uh, the differences of processing, trade, and the you no know, processing domestic farms. That is uh, uh, very uh, important uh, for the globalization analysis. So uh, in the latest uh, ICIO, we will publish soon, which is like uh, in few months time. Uh, we have uh, 66 uh, individual economies plus the rest of the world and the, um, the industry classification in CRC6. Uh, the core years will be uh, 1995 to 2018. So this is a summary of the country coverage. Uh, it's a summary of the industry list of 36 industries. Um, it's uh, uh, input output structure. So from here, uh, we can have uh, gross imports of each country. Uh, gross exports, and of course we can have a, a GDP in the output or income approach from this ICIO, and the uh, GDP in the expenditure side. It's a bit complicated to produce from the ICIO, but we can still uh, present from the uh, ICIO structure. Just a gentle so, note, just a gentle nudge, Sanji, if you've got four and a half, five minutes to go. Thank you. So uh, this is a compilation overview. Uh, so we, I already, I think, uh, mentioned about this. Uh, so what we can present from the, this uh, ICIO analysis, uh, is I summarize the uh, uh, main results. So for the TIVA database, um, it's the same, um, but we can confirm empirically for each country that export requires imports, but it still uh, depends on the sectors and also the size of the economies. And the, uh, we can understand the contribution of the upper stage uh, sectors on the uh, exports. Uh, for example, the service and utility sector's contributions for the uh, export activities. And then the uh, different trade partner relationship, 
can be um, presented in uh, gross exports. But of course, uh, the, this uh, relationship is uh, very different for uh, each partner. And also, um, another important thing that we have to mention is that in our TIVA indicators, uh, since we have uh, many countries, we can have a uh, uh, different combination of the uh, regions, such as uh, 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 European Union, ASEAN, uh, APEC. So those um, um, uh, the different uh, region groups can be also uh, estimated. So it's, uh, it's simple such uh, to estimate the indicators like uh, French exports to uh, other uh, EU member uh, countries. Okay. And then uh, we have uh, other uh, applications such as trade and employment, uh, compensation employees in the similar ways. Uh, we can have a varied uh, uh, relationship to that. And also uh, we expanded uh, recently uh, this uh, employment uh, jobs uh, indicators into uh, gender and skill dimensions. So that can also uh, support the uh, complement the uh, analysis. Okay. And the, uh, we also have uh, some other uh, SDG indicators uh, on uh, carbon emissions. And we are going to uh, publish soon the new report on that and also some other uh, SDG uh, indicators uh, from these uh, activities. So this is uh, uh, one example of the TIVA, but let me go to the next So uh, to conclude, uh, we can uh, expect countries to provide more uh, information in the near future. So the ideal uh, data sources for us is to uh, for countries to uh, fill the uh, gaps of the national account SUTs, of course, and also uh, to estimate some uh, detailed uh, format, uh, which is not uh, uh, available in the current uh, published uh, data sources. And also, uh, it's, I think, uh, important to have uh, national classifications would be uh, harmonized with the uh, international classification in uh, and with, uh, yes, and sufficient details such as uh, two-digit level uh, information. So, thank you. Uh, please let us know if you have a question in email or uh, the session. Thank you very much for that, Nori. Um, I haven't got any questions in the chat. Is it because it's Friday afternoon morning and people are still waking up? But in the meantime, while people are waking up or maybe even having this cereal, um, I've got two questions for you, Nori, just to get going. Um, obviously, I've seen a lot of the information before, but I, I am also appreciative of the huge efforts that you have to put in to do the harmonization of so many different countries. If there was one thing all the countries could do to make your life easier, what would that one thing be? And then my second question is obviously on the SIF FOB, that's quite a big challenge, not conceptually, but in terms of practical measurement and getting sources. If the SIF FOB moved to invoice values, any early thoughts on what your views are on invoice values for this activity. And in the meantime, I would hope other people can think of some questions. Over to you, Nori. Okay, so uh, the first one, uh, one thing uh, I would expect, I'm a analysis of, uh, we do analysis of the input output uh, SUDs, but actually, uh, I think the most important thing is in national accounts. Uh, if we see a good national accounts database, 
it means that those countries are developing uh, good quality uh, SUTs, input output data sources, and so and also they uh, publish that. So that means that if we don't have a good national accounts, uh, we don't get a good input output. It means that so one thing is that we won't have a, a good uh, time series harmonized SUTs and also some details such as uh, trading in uh, direct purchases, uh, services, components, and the uh, capital formation, a uh, detailed capital formation information in national accounts database. I think that's one thing uh, it's very important for the development of the global harmonized uh, input system. And the second question about the CIF, FOB, um, um, I think you mentioned about CIF, FOB adjustment in the uh, SUT or national account framework, not the bilateral trade flows. So if it's formal, uh, it's true that it's difficult to uh, work with the uh, uh, official data because not many countries are able to provide the CIF FOB in the uh, in the SUT in by product. It means that we only see the aggregate number, and usually we cannot get that information like what you can do in the official statistics. Was the I don't know. I mean, if the all countries are able to provide the invoice information of the, um, the base price of FAB price and the transportation or insurance cost, and that would be also ideal for us to proceed. But actually, I probably miss your second point. So that's okay. Right. So I don't see any further desire for further questions. Going, going, whoa, Ariel. Um, Ariel um, has got a question, go ahead. Uh, hello, thank you for your presentation. I was uh, mainly wondering uh, what are the key challenges to produce OECD uh, ECO tables at past year prices? Yes, that's a good question. So that's what we were actually facing last uh, few months. Um, the, in case of Europe and many other countries, from I would say from 2010, most countries' uh, data sources are easy because they are ISIC-4 based and this 2008 SNA. When it goes back to earlier years, it's uh, difficult, especially sector components. Um, that's, really uh, difficult. So that's, I think, uh, uh, difficult. And also, uh, it's not so easy to work with the constant price or previous year price information, because in the uh, national sources, it's relatively easy and what uh, other, most countries do to uh, deflate the SUTs. But in the global time, uh, our main uh, target is to estimate the uh, good quality uh, bar uh, trade balances, which is always uh, presented in the um, uh, current prices. And also our target is to understand the uh, income in the uh, variable side. And that's also always uh, current price uh, analysis is a uh, majority. So that's I think there are some, uh, um, I would say, uh, the differences from uh, what people expect. Thanks, Nori. I think people are getting Nori's warming house. up now. There's two more questions. We'll take them yes. quickly, uh, definitely very quickly, otherwise time's moving on, and people can talk to others in the chat, etc. So the first one is from Oscar. Well, good morning, Oscar. Good morning, Sanjeev. Uh, thank you for the wonderful work and a very nice presentation, Nori. Uh, I was wondering when you will publish what date 
uh, had, uh, I think, of the indicators, the ICIO, uh, employment skill. I cannot imagine that you will publish everything because you have done so much work. Uh, but I'm wondering what will you publish and when exactly will it va be available to us as an audience? Thank you. Um, yes, so yes, not, not all numbers will be available soon. We will first publish uh, the, the core indicators first in a few months' time. And the other uh, analysis, such as employment and detailed, uh, what we call uh, by sector BSCIQ, it's, uh, it's a de very detailed um, variable by source country indices. Those will be um, published uh, afterwards. Uh, and of course, the other analysis will be um, estimated later. And I think I have another question about backward and forward linkages. Yeah. yeah. Yes and, and no on that answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, those are, yes, they are available. And it's, we don't probably call it backward and forward linkage explicit for some reasons, but uh, they are available. And let us know later, I can navigate you where you can find those uh, numbers. I think it's a good, very good question from Summit, but that raises lots of issues on the reconciliation and the harmonization. I'm not so sure if we want to spend more than 20 seconds on this because we will need to move on to the next. So I'll give you 20 seconds, Nori. Yes, so uh, to reconcile the bilateral trade, um, there are also some significant uh, improvement in our colleague at the Statistical Directorate. Uh, we see uh, WTO um, data. Um, so this time, uh, it's, we also spend some time to investigate on that. So we don't try to use uh, uh, the official um, trading services by partner database, uh, but we try to use this um, input um, balanced uh, TIS. So we hope we could have a better trade asymmetry from the beginning. So I hope so. Yeah, I will see. Okay, thank you very much, Nori. And thank you to the attendees for the questions. We'll now, uh, Nori, if you can uh, unshare your screen. Yes. And Jose, if you can share your screen and over to you for the second presentation. And just a reminder for the attendees, Jose, is from the European Commission. Yeah, I'm sharing the screen now. Um, well, now I cannot see. Yeah, let's uh, hold on a bit. Yes, hold on a second, please. Okay. Do you see the slides now? Yes, Jose, go ahead. Okay, okay. I was not free. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the purpose of my presentation is to show how the collaborative efforts of EU member states, other non EU countries, and international statistical agencies like the OECD. Uh, to compile multi-country supply use and input output tables is worthwhile taking in light of the empirical evidence-based support that they can provide to trade policy, for example. For instance, measuring services value added in the exports of manufacturing goods can be highly relevant within the context of possible revisions of WTO rules on duty exceptions 
for those services, for example, incorporated in the goods exported to countries for which new trade agreements would have to be negotiated or renegotiated. In order to measure all this, our needs to complement trade statistics data on goods and services and national accounts data with the so-called multi-country supply use and input output tables. So the Eurostat figured a project aims to develop and implement a regular production process of European Union inter-country supply use and input output tables at current and previous year prices uh, from 2010 to 2016, now casting uh, a couple of years uh, up to 2018 at current prices only. And in each release and benchmarked with uh, the latest national accounts data. The countries covered are the 27 member states separately, United Kingdom, United States, Canada, China, Switzerland, India, Japan, South Korea, Mexico, Norway, Russia, Turkey, and the rest of the world. Time permitting, Eurostat is also planning to add 2019 and a few more countries in order to have the G20 included by May 21, 2021, where there will be a big dissemination event organized in, in, in Brussels. So I borrowed this picture from our OECD colleagues to illustrate how inter-country input output tables look like. Hoping you are already familiar with national input output tables. Those are built up based on seven main blocks, as you see here. Block one refers to intermediate domestic uses with, while block two reports the value added component, taxes the subsidies and products and output by industries. Final demand of domestically produced goods and services, excluding exports, as shown in block three. And differently from national input output tables, block four and five depict one country's exports of intermediate and final use goods and services separately by product and trading partner. Eventually, block six and seven depict country A's imports of intermediate and final use goods and services by product and trading partner too. In fact, inter-country input output tables are nothing else than a detailed, balanced and consistent description of the national accounts of countries with the support of international merchandise trade and balance of payments data, among other data sources, as Nori has well explained. Therefore, the figure of project has worked to prepare all necessary national supply use and input output tables at basic and purchase prices with a distinction between domestic and import uses. A combination of contrade, UN contrade and COMEX databases for merchandise trade has made possible to disentangle the trade flows among re exports, quasi transit trade and domestic exports, uh, being facilitated by a previously balanced view of trade with trade symmetries removed, according to uh, uh, an approach which is very similar to that of the OECD. International trade statistics and, 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 and balance of payments data were used uh, uh, on services for balancing trade and services as well. A lot of work is also made to align trade statistic values with national accounts values. In doing so, we rely on voluntary data transmitted by member states in relation to goods and the flow to processing, merchanting, and CIF for valuation adjustments. Uh, all the related work concerns the estimation of detailed product and country of origin or destination of purchases by non-residents and purchases by of residents uh, abroad. The figure of tables as well as the OECD tables are currently the only ones that have continuity guaranteed as far as I know and are compiled by international statistical agencies. There are other similar projects developed in the academic world such as the ERA, GTAP, Xiobase, databases and others such as WIRED and IDG for Asia that, as far as I know, have stopped producing such tables. The figure of project is implemented through the collaborative efforts of various units within Eurostat and the European Commission's Joint Research Center, where I work. These units include those of national accounts, trading goods, trading services, environmental accounts, and data services. You see just the numbers, but I, I'm telling you the, what that numbers mean, uh, the unit numbers. There's only one, uh, there, there's one annual technical group meeting where participants of all EU member states gather together with others from the OECD, European Central Bank, uh, United Nations Statistical Division, a steering committee formed by the main related policy DGs in the European Commission and OECD, ECB and UNSD also steers the work of this uh, project. The first Eurostat attempt 
to compile the figure tables included only one year, 2010, at current prices for the EU28, including UK and only one non-EU country, that is uh, United States. We received extensive support from the OECD and the wired compilers to develop the Eurostat's own strategy, which is described in a book published in 2019. We carried out this work in 2016 and 17. The second stage is about to finish by the end of this year, since 2018. And as I said earlier, it would provide with the regular production process with which to release annual Eurostat inter-country supplies and input output tables from 2000 for 2021 onwards, every April uh, in coordination with the OECD. Our third stage has already started in June 2020 and it will reach me until mid 2023 for the progress expected in the use of more detailed and unpolished voluntary information of countries, uh, integration with the OECD, global input output tables, ICIO, regular production of the figure of tables in previous year prices, the development of a set of EU focused TIVA indicators and national accounting intercountry matrices, whatever possible. The annual production process is tentatively scheduled in the following way. The first quarter of every year would be devoted to collect the necessary input and prepare the estimation and release of the figure of tables in April. The second quarter would be used to calculate the TIVA indicators and publish them. Data collection, data preparation, and further improvements in the methodology, scripts, codes, etc., will be done during the second half of every year. And last but least important, the figure of global input output tables will have passed the official standards in terms of quality validation rules as any other Eurostat statistics. So we would be able to provide insights into the changes made to the original input data at every step on the replicability and on the transparency of the methods uh, used. Now let me move uh, on into the analysis. Uh, so why all these tables are built up? I mean, uh, there are various examples, but I've chosen this one. Uh, there is a variety of different trade flows between the EU and the United Kingdom with also repercussions in other countries. Uh, I, I've chosen United Kingdom, I mean, just because of the conference, which is located in the UK. So the simplest example is the following. We can think of a German car exported to the UK and generating value added and jobs there in the EU. Germany can also export motor engines instead to a UK car factory that would sell the car domestically in the UK or to elsewhere, for instance, to Japan. Goods could even cross the border twice, embedded in other manufacturing goods, such as a case, for instance, of French steel embodied into English motor engines that are coming back to the EU, maybe to Germany, to produce cars that will be sold elsewhere. There are, of course, other effects in other countries as a result of each one of the types of trade flows just sketched before. These are called foreign effects, while the former are denominated domestic effects. Both can be analyzed by industry, skill levels, etc. So in order to investigate the value added jobs and why not emissions embodied in trade flows and global value chains, global inter-country input output tables have become crucial. As an illustrative example, let me describe briefly in the following slides the results of measuring services value added embodied in the EU exports of manufacturing goods to the UK using the wire database in the absence of the Figaro tables yet. So around 12% of the EU exports to non-EU countries go to the UK being Malta and Ireland, the two countries with the largest shares remarkably, Malta with more than a half. But how much of the value added generated by those EU exports to the UK is retained within the EU? The answer is approximately three quarters, being over 80% in countries like Croatia, Italy, Austria, Germany, France, Romania, and Greece, and much below 50% in countries like Lithuania, Luxembourg, or Malta. Malta seems to be a remarkable case, exporting a lot to the UK and retaining the least value added in the EU. That's something to investigate further. In this light, we can answer to the following question. How much of the value added retained or embodied in the EU exports of manufacturing goods to the UK is generated in services activities? 
as you could see in the in the green middle block of this uh, chart it is 34 percent or almost 51 billion euro which is a bit more than one out of three euro of EU exports of manufactured goods to the UK or services incorporated into the goods exported. And uh, which type of services are embodied in such exports? Now we've seen the amount of total services, but now we look into more detail. So this slide uh, shows that the top three services activities are generally wholesale trade, except of motor vehicles and motorcycles, administrative and support services activities, and legal and accounting activities, activities of head offices, etc. Another interesting question would be where, in which EU country, those services value added embodied in new exports of manufacturing goods to the UK are generated. So it seems that almost 60% of that is generated in three countries, Germany, France, and Italy. But we might also want to know how much value added was generated in the services sectors of the whole EU to the exports of manufacturing goods of one specific EU country to the UK. In this slide, it's, it, it's very interesting to know that we have identified that Greece reported the largest share with 44%, followed by Belgium and Italy with 39. In other words, 44% of the EU value added embodied in the Greek exports of manufactured goods to the UK were generated in the services activities across the whole European Union. Next, uh, in this slide, uh, we can see uh, that the EU exports of manufactured goods to the UK contributed to 41% of the total value added generated in the EU services sectors as a result of the total EU exports to the UK. In other words, a bit more than two-fifths of the total services value added generated in the EU were due to EU export of manufactured goods, always referred to the EU, UK trade. And this share is the largest in land and transport, land transport and wholesale retail trade of motor vehicles and motorcycles with more than 50%. Although these were not certainly the ones reporting the biggest generation of value added, which is, as you see at the bottom of the chart, administrative support service activities and wholesale trade. Another interesting question would be, where in the EU, in which country the EU exports to the UK contributed most to the generation of value added in the EU services sectors? As shown in this slide, more than half of the services value added embodied in all EU exports to the UK are generated again in three countries, Germany, France, and this time, in the Netherlands instead of Italy. Finally, last slide would tell us for each country how much the EU exports of manufactured products to the UK have contributed to the total services value added generated in such country due to the EU exports of all products to the UK. As an example, more than two thirds of the services value added generated in Lithuania by all EU exports to the UK would correspond to manufactured goods. So with the summary of facts that I will not repeat again, but you can, you can see them uh, in the slide, I would like to finish my presentation coming back to its main objective, which was to show how inter-country supply use and input output tables can play a relevant role in providing empirical evidence-based support for trade policy and other policies where input output tables could be used. So as uh, I'm following up, following up uh, Norris uh, final message, so it's very important to have the support of statistical offices in providing uh, not co compulsory but voluntary data to populate many of the gaps that we would need to, co to, 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 to fill in for compiling these ICIO tables because their use and application uh, are very relevant in some policy uh, issues and some policies uh, in the European Commission and I guess that also in the UK government or any country's government. So thank you very much for your attention. I think that that's all. Thank you. Am I on time, right Sanjeev?
Jose, that's excellent in terms of timing. Well done. You're, you've got four minutes to spare, but that means hopefully we get some more questions. I, as I look at the QA section, I don't have any. Obviously, the attendees are slow starters when the firing gun has been uh, set off. So in the meantime, what I will do is I've got a couple of thoughts for you. First one is, do you plan to do any analysis of the relationship of the UK and the rest of the EU and vice versa as a result of COVID-19? Because you've got the framework, you've got the base, but you need to get some information on the short term estimates so you can sort of project from the last base. Um, the second one is we know that there's considerable asymmetries in goods, but more importantly in services. I think one third of the asymmetries in the services in the EU are contributed by the UK. A nice achievement. <laughs> but what would happen if you took different assumptions in the reconciliation of the tables how, in terms of developing sensitivity analysis? What range of impacts would that have on those estimates you said as part of the conclusions? Um, so sort of getting a variance on those will be useful. And as I look at the QA, people are still not coming on board. I'll throw in another one then. Um, how will you handle the UK possibly leaving the EU and becoming part of the non-EU? I.e., for example, will you have a discontinuity from January 2021? Or will you take it out for the whole database? So how, how will you handle that? Because obviously in the economic, in the real world, it is a structural discontinuity. And I have now got another question. Might as well get Summit is coming. So I'll put this question as well so you can take all of them together. So um, over to you, Summit. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, and I think it kind of reaffirmed one of my beliefs, but in an increasingly globalised economy, uh, trading value added seems much more relevant than kind of traditional gross and net tra trade flows between countries. But it seems that they're not as widely understood or applied um, in the wider community. So if you agree, I was just wondering what more do you feel we need to do to work with other NSIs, um, the international community, but also users to increase how much Kiva is understood and how much it's used and kind of modeling and kind of this analysis. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sumit. Over to you, Jose. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, let me start first with, with your comments uh, and questions, Sanjeev. So, uh, um, yeah, there, there, there are plans to follow the relationships, the trade relationships between uh, EU and, and the United Kingdom uh, in relation to COVID. Uh, but uh, this has ha have to be done using the, I mean, trade statistics because you know supply in these tables. I mean, that takes time. So yeah, we will not see the, and I would like to see. I mean, I would like to have a crystal ball and see how the input output tables of 2020 would look like in three or four years uh, uh, from now because uh, there will be a dramatic change in, uh, from one year to another. Uh, so, uh, I mean, yes, I mean, we, we, are, I mean, we are planning, we, we have, uh, we are using COMEX data, we are using, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the Eurostat's uh, information at a very little level, even at the six digit, eight digit level of CN to see, uh, vulner to identify vulnerabilities. I mean, not respect to UK, but respect to other countries. And I think that uh, with the UK, um, yeah, we will also deal with that. So, I mean, yeah, we, we do some work. We will do some work on this, uh, I, I know. Then it, it's a very good idea, I mean, to uh, stop by for a while and say, okay, if we have different approaches to balance trade asymmetries, how would that affect the multipliers? I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's what you measure. Uh, in, in when you measure services embodied in, in, in exports of goods. Yeah, I take note of this. It's not easy. Uh, it requires time, uh, you know, but you'd like always to give me work and more work. So, um, yes, it, it's a good idea. Uh, I have to say about it that in Figaro, we, we do something 
similar, which is in every step we do uh, that we change any input uh, data uh, from, 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 from origin, uh, I mean, then we identify how much we've changed of every data. So in that sense, if there are peak or some, uh, let's say, big change somewhere, then we spot it and then we can go backwards and say w from where this happened and then yeah, find the justification or change things. So it's not a sensitivity, but at least we, we can follow uh, this, uh, this uh, let's say, quality uh, or validation. So uh, uh, I don't think there will be any discontinuity because in the past, I mean, the Figaro tables are, uh, had uh, 28 countries um, separated. So there, uh, now, now we will retain UK as a separate country, as US, uh, and then as others that we will add, uh, China, uh, Japan, etc. So it will remain as it is. I mean, we will show, we will see the changes in the structure but not uh, in the in the in the, in the Figaro tables as 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 itself. Okay, uh, and then the question from uh, uh, Summit from uh, colleague. So uh, my recommendation is to uh, to keep having producers and users of input output tables together, like we uh, try to do in the International Input Output Association. That's the only way I think to convey the message that there are things changing in the SNA and will change, and that are relevant for measuring global value chains and trade in, in, in value-added terms. And, and then, I mean, with the, the, the academic world, the users have to learn about these changes and how to use them, and the other way around. So I think that, um, I mean, this would be a, a, good, uh, a good answer, in my view, for, for, for this question. Thank you. Jose, I think uh, in the process of you answering those questions, there's another couple that have come through. Um, I'll ask Keshab. I have Keshab to ask your question. Um, hi, uh, this was a very, very nice presentation about the, and very topical about the Brexit context as well. I mean, uh, there was a lot of debate in the Brexit about the role of financial sector, UK leading the financial sector. And so, I mean, uh, in your presentation, I mean, that was not explicitly mentioned. Another area was about the high skill sector, UK leading to the high skill sector. You mentioned that the major proportion was the uh, administrative, other things like that, uh, services. So could you say something about this uh, financial services and uh, skill? And uh, another sub question was that is Figaro available for public use? Mm -hmm. Thank Jose, you. before you start answering, I'm going to bring in the, yes, yeah. the last question as well, so you can answer them together in the spirit of time. Um, Ariel, would you like to ask your question, please? Uh, yes, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, it was very interesting and insightful. I was uh, simply wondering whether the release of the Figaro intercountry input output table will be accompanied by a set of socioeconomic accounts for all countries included in that table. Uh, that would include, for example, employment and capital formation by industry of destination, CO2 emissions, et cetera. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ariel. Over to you, Jose. Yes. Yeah, thank you. So uh, regarding the first question of Keshab, um, I mean, the, the um, I mean, I have the, the figures, I mean, of, uh, I mean, we could make the calculations of how much is a proportion of high skill uh, employment in the, in, in the services embodied in the EU exports of manufactured goods and, and uh, also financial services. Uh, for reasons of time and the space, I, I haven't shown them, but uh, I mean, you can write to me and then I can, I can send them to you easily. So uh, you. remember that, I mean, the results are used or are made with WIOD, World Input Output Database of release 2016, and correspond to the year 2014. So, I mean, this is an illustrative example to show what can be done. Uh, surely this should be done again with the latest release of the OCD tables, for example, or maybe the Figaro tables whenever they, they will be there. So, I mean, I can give you the numbers, but, you know, use them uh, or treat them care, uh, carefully. So. Uh, uh, they, they come from 
from our old database in that sense. And Figaro will be publicly available, of course, that's any Eurostat uh, uh, statistics. And uh, uh, hopefully as official statistics, now they are located in a sort of experimental section of, of Eurostat uh, website. Regarding the second question, uh, well, um, what we will provide with Figaro tables uh, is more information on the changes made to align trade statistics with national accounts. I mean, this good center of growth processing, merchanting, and all these changes. Also, we will provide information on direct purchase abroad and purchases of non-residents in the territory by product and country of origin destination. But employment, emissions, etc., that you can plug into the tables, then we will refer to a link in the Eurostat website where you can find that data on employment or emissions, etc. So that you can download the figure of tables, employment data and emissions, etc., from somewhere else and then put them together. So that there will not be a social economy account as such, but links that can lead you to the data where, where it's located. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose, and thank you to the people asking the questions. Much appreciated. So what we'll now do is, Jose, if you can stop your screen, and Luke Weston from the ONS, the Office for National Statistics in the UK, if you can share your screen and off you go. Okay, I've just unmuted, so hopefully you can hear me, and I'm just about to share my screen now. Definitely hear you. Brilliant. Okay. And can see your screen. Excellent. Super. I'll make a start then. Thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, let me first begin by saying once again, good morning to everyone. And, and of course, I hope you're all keeping well at this time. Uh, my name is Luke Weston. I'm the technical lead for trade asymmetries here at the Office for National Statistics. And I'm going to be presenting over the next 15 to 20 minutes an overview of UK trade asymmetries. Uh, touching a little on, on what we've done so far and thinking ahead to what comes next. So a bit more of an outline here. Um, I'm going to begin just by setting out once again what are trade asymmetries. I think we've got a, a very informed audience, but I'll, I'll go over that uh, just to begin with. Um, I'll touch upon the data, so noting the UK's top bilateral trade asymmetries. I'll then proceed to talk a little about some of the international collaborative analysis that we've done. And I'll draw attention specifically to um, our collaboration with the United States and what we've learned from that. And then, as I said a moment ago, thinking about what comes next. So first of all, what are trade asymmetries? Nice and basic. So uh, trade asymmetries, they exist across global trade statistics where two countries publish different estimates for the same trade flow. So for example, the estimate of credits from uh, country A to country B should in theory equal the estimate of debits or, or imports by country B from country A. So I've set this out graphically just to inject a little bit of color into the presentation. So you can see an example here, just to highlight that these numbers are completely fictitious, um, nice round numbers for the purposes of the illustration. Um, so if we had a flow of services from the United Kingdom uh, to the United States, and the UK were to uh, value these exports at 10 billion pounds, and the United States were to estimate the imports at five billion pounds, then from the United Kingdom's perspective, we would have an export asymmetry of 10 minus five billion, so plus five billion pounds. And again, just um, to be clear, um, you can see from the other side, so if the United Kingdom are importing services this time, and we estimate six billion pounds of imports, whereas the United States estimate eight billion pounds of exports. You can see again from the UK's perspective, we have an import asymmetry of negative two billion pounds. Um, so very briefly, I won't go too much into this, but you can see that um, 
we calculate both positive and negative asymmetries uh, and when the sign is negative that means the partner country estimate uh, or the mirror data are higher than the UK estimate and when the sign is positive uh, the UK estimate is higher than the partner country estimate. So, so that's a little on the theory of trade asymmetries. Um, in practice, of course, difficulties and, and, and differences in the measurement of trade flows uh, mean that these estimates don't uh, often match in practice. Um, really, the existence of trade asymmetries is, is something of an inevitable consequence of what is uh, an increasingly complex globalization process. Um, so we've talked a little bit about that uh, already this morning um, and, and also where the value of trade, notwithstanding the first half of this year, has, has generally increased over time. Um, why is this important? Well, of course, understanding and where possible uh, reconciling asymmetries is important for better decision making regarding international trade. At the moment for the United Kingdom, that's particularly um, relevant in the context of firstly the EU referendum vote um, and, and now Brexit and, and ongoing trade negotiations. So to that effect, uh, as you might expect in the context of Brexit, um, here in the UK some of our key stakeholders are the Central Bank, the Bank of England, uh, also the Department of International Trade, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, Treasury, uh, revenue and customs and prior to January of this year the department for exiting the European Union. Uh, we meet with these key stakeholders at least quarterly at uh, dedicated user group meetings and, and here we we share the work we're all doing to understand trade asymmetries but in the context also of, of wider improvements to trade data that we're undertaking here at the ONS. So that's just an overview of the theory. So I'm just going to talk uh, a little now around the, the data and highlight some of the UK's top bilateral trade asymmetries. So I'm going to just begin by highlighting uh, trading goods asymmetries. So here we have the top five UK export and import trading goods asymmetries by partner country in the year 2018. And we're looking at uh, billions of pounds here uh, and the data are from the United Nations com trade. As you can see uh, the Netherlands um, are the country with which we've got the uh, largest total absolute asymmetry. Um, so we've got uh, exports recorded by the UK of 25.9 billion. Uh, the, the imports as measured by Netherlands are lower and that gives us uh, an asymmetry on the export side of 4.3 billion and again um, we in the UK uh, have a high estimate for imports from the Netherlands 42 billion pounds very nearly um, and that gives us an asymmetry there of 8.2 billion so Netherlands top there uh, China Germany the United States and Ireland making up the top five um, so we here at the Office for National Statistics haven't focused quite so much on trading goods asymmetries and you'll see from the next slide that these tend to be uh, lower than those for trade in services. Um, HMRC do publish analysis uh, on a six, six monthly basis and they split uh, EU and non-EU trading goods asymmetries so uh, I would steer you in that direction if you would like to learn a little bit more about trading goods asymmetries. So a similar slide here, uh, looking at the top bilateral trade in services asymmetries this time. So um, once again, 2018 data, this time sourced from the ONS, the United States Bureau of Economic Analysis for, for the US data, and also Eurostat. And you can see that the United States by a little distance is uh, the, the country with which we have the highest trade in services asymmetries. Um, fairly evenly split in 2018 between exports and imports. 
debts and, and a total of, of 48.7 billion. And then once again, we've got some of our larger trading partners, so Ireland, Netherlands, Germany and France, uh, comprising the remainder of that top five. So I'll, I'll go on now just to touch upon some of the international collaborative analysis that we've uh, managed to do so far. Um, so in terms of our approach to this, um, I've, I've set out in the next couple of slides that the steps that we take to, to conduct this. So first of all, we look to analyze the bilateral trade data. And as I mentioned, our focus has been on services from international databases. So uh, again, these have been talked about a little so far, WTO, Eurostat, OECD. We also compare published bilateral information on, on trade data sources and methods. Um, for example, these are often published on uh, National Statistical Institute's uh, websites. We then establish contact with trade statisticians and economists in uh, partner country institutions or central banks as appropriate, and then look to set up uh, a series of bilateral uh, conversations really um, to, to analyze asymmetries. Uh, we use these to, to seek to exchange trade data then at the lowest uh, level available, um, at which you know, we can both share data alongside more detailed information on uh, trade data sources collection and compilation methods. We then work collaboratively to analyze these differences, again, sources, methods, and also the classification of trade items, and, and try and quantify these differences where possible. We share the results of the analysis uh, and agree what can and can't be published. And then um, over the longer term, we seek to continue to work with um, colleagues there to, to put uh, revisions where that's appropriate um, into our national accounts. So um, focusing a little on the United States, um, I think we've, it's been fair to say we've had relatively, uh, you know, relative success with the United States um, and we've been able to identify uh, a little bit of trade uh, emitted and in, or included um, by the United States that leads directly to trade asymmetries at the very top level. Uh, one example of this is crown dependencies. So we, we now know that the United States include the crown dependencies in their estimates of uh, UK trade data. Um, apologies if you can see that on my screen, I'll get rid of it. Um, whereas we in the United Kingdom don't. Um, and while that's not a, a huge, um, uh, sort of a huge pounds billion value, um, it, it's, you know, something that we didn't know before. Um, and we also have learned a little more about where trade flows have been recorded in different areas of the accounts, so different service types. Um, now this leads to asymmetries in the lower level um, EBOPS service type categories, but not in total trade. However, uh, this still has a useful function. It helps us obviously to understand more about the lower level data, and this can be useful in the context that the UK is currently in, in terms of uh, trade negotiations, for example. So um, I, I touched upon these a moment ago. So um, in terms of these lower level trade components, we've been able to identify uh, nearly 2 billion uh, pounds for the export asymmetry um, and slightly less on the import asymmetry side uh, and then some definitional differences where uh, the United States omit trade activity that we include. Um, we've got 9.8 billion pounds that we were able to quantify on the export side and nearly 3 billion on the import side. Uh, most of this was comprised of financial services. So um, at the time of, of doing this analysis and at the time of publishing our most recent article, which was back in February this year, um, the United States wasn't uh, presenting um, any data on FISM, financial intermediation services indirectly measured. 
uh, nor were they presenting anything on net spread earnings. So, so they were um, they contributed uh, quite a lot of that 9.8 billion pounds and we also noted that they weren't including passenger sea transport so that accounted for about one and a half billion pounds of the asymmetry. Um, since we've done that analysis the United States Bureau of Economic Analysis have published updated trade in services statistics uh, and this has brought the presentation of US data more in line with uh, BPM6 introduce some uh, methods improvements and also improvements in service types where as noted we, we'd previously identified and quantified some differences so while of course you know we can't take uh, all the credit for that it, it's encouraging to know that some of these bilateral discussions and, and conversations that we have had um, have helped the United States in improving their data in this way Okay, so just to draw the presentation towards a close, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, what comes next for UK trade asymmetries analysis. So um, a few things. First of all, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this in, in just a moment, but we're currently working on what we're calling an experimental trading services data set. Um, this, this is going to draw on uh, quite heavily on work that um, the OECD and, and WTO have done previously, uh, looking to, to reconcile the um, asymmetries between countries for trade in services at the top level. Um, we're also looking to make use of VAT data to analyse uh, our, our trade in services flows, comparing our estimates with that um, administrative data to understand some of the quality and accuracy of our data and to see whether we can make improvements based on that. Um, we're also linking up with a team that we have here called the Large Cases Unit uh, to identify some of the, the, the company practices that may lead to asymmetries. Now I, I recognise when I, I read that back that maybe sounds a little bit sinister when I say identify company practices. Um, it, it certainly we're not auditing in, in that sinister way. Um, really, the large cases unit are looking to, to help uh, company accountants understand how we measure trade in the hope that they can understand better what we're looking for and we get uh, better survey data. But it's also for us to understand um, better how companies operate in this globalised world. What do global value chains look like in practice? Um, and then thinking about what we can learn and how we can adapt to better measure these flows. And then finally, of course, we want to continue having uh, really positive bilateral discussions. Uh, we've generally had a really positive response when engaging with other countries. Um, there are the usual blockers in terms of resource and time, um, but generally everybody's been really receptive. Um, Data access can sometimes be a little frustrating, um, but you know we really want to continue uh, these bilateral discussions, and um, we think this is a really good way to to learn more about asymmetries and hopefully reduce those. So I mentioned um, we're working on this experimental trade in services data set um, in 2017 the OECD and World Trade Organization published uh, a methodology that um, was used to create a global data set of balanced trade in services statistics by country and service type. So we're looking at this model and, and seeking initially just to, to replicate and update the analysis for a, a smaller subset of countries. Um, and we're hoping that this is going to tell us uh, a little bit more about the, the relative position of the UK as far as trade asymmetries is concerned. Um, and then this may be a, a stepping stone for us towards certainly further analysis, linking up more widely with uh, other institutions again, and um, possibly making some adjustments in the medium term uh, to our trade data. So that's um, we're looking to publish that in late autumn. 
So that's it in terms of the slides I've got. So I'll hand back to Sanjeev, who I, I think is going to open up the floor to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Uh, you're in time as well. Much appreciated. Um, on this occasion, I won't tease you with a question. I might do in a few moments. Uh, as there is already a question that's been raised by Ariel. So Ariel, I'll hand over to you to ask your question. Ah, thank you very much and thanks for the presentation. Uh, I know this might not have been covered because you focused on service trade, but I was wondering, given that the UK has the highest trade asymmetry in goods with the Netherlands, what would you think might be the role of the Rotterdam effect in this trade asymmetry, given that uh, the UK exports to non-EU countries through the Netherlands being reported as exports to the Netherlands may seem to be inflated the export uh, from the UK to the Netherlands, which in fact corresponds to uh, that figure being higher than the mirror uh, figure reported by the Netherlands. Thanks. I, thanks for the question. Sorry, can I just ask you to repeat the second half of that because you cut out and I, I lost you just for a moment there. Is that okay? Yes, yes. Uh, I was simply thinking that if the ONS has maybe tried to explain the 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 mirror exports, uh, so the export from the UK to the Netherlands being higher than the mirror imports from the Netherlands, uh, as uh, part of the Rotterdam effect, that is that there are UK exports to non-EU countries through the Netherlands that are reported as exports to the Netherlands. And so the, the, the UK export figure is inflated. Thank you for the question, first of all. Um, so we, we haven't looked specifically at this, um, and, and I know you noted particularly on, on trading goods, so we, we haven't focused predominantly on on, on trading goods. Our analysis has been targeted towards trading services based on, on those stakeholders and, and the fact that our trading services statistics or, or, or asymmetries are, are much higher. Um, I, I think you, you raise a good point about sort of um, exports and, and re-exports and that sort of thing. Um, so I, I think it's certainly something we would look to pick up in the near future once again um, and, and hopefully have a sort of an answer to your, your question in the sort of fairly near term. Thanks, Luke. Um, just very quickly in response to Ariel, I think there's a combination of imports for re-export, transit mm. trade and actual trade. So it may not necessarily be easy to delineate all three, but nonetheless, the work should be done and your point is a valid point. So next question is over from to Oscar. Um, well, actually it is not really a question, but more a remark, uh, namely that uh, National Institute for Economic and Social Research is currently working, finishing a study about, among others, the, the Rotterdam effect. They use specially made data of Statistics Netherlands, and I think this might already give quite some information about the, the symmetries that one sees at the moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Oscar. Um, as that's a remark, I'll move on. Uh, Sumit, over to you. Thanks so much, Luke, for that talk. Uh, it was really interesting. Uh, it was just your one of your final slides. You kind of spoke a little bit around um, the experimental trading services figures that you're looking to produce uh, later this year. And I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more um, on the kind of the basic parameters of that model in terms of how you'd go about if reconciling the, 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 the symmetries is the right way to think about it, but also um, how you might how you think this might impact upon how NSIs record trading services in the future, but also its implications on, on TIVA. Uh, and I was just wondering if you had any views on whether you think that there would be that knock-on effect, just trying to bring it back to the early presentations. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sumit. Thank you, Luke. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so, I mean, what we're looking to do, th this really 
is our first attempt to to create some sort of reconciled data set of exports and imports where we we take our data um, and then we, we look at the relative strength of other countries data and the asymmetries uh, and, and come to some some reconciled value um, in, in terms of you know what that means I think then for, for Tiva at the moment um, we're, we're just sort of using this as a stepping stone to just investigate a little bit more whether it might be one means by which in the medium term we, we make adjustments in, in national accounts but we're not in a position yet to say yes we're definitely going to do this or no we're definitely not um, so this is not at this point for us based on this work a, a knock-on impact for Tiva there is of course um, a sort of wider link there and, and we would look to use this as I say as a stepping stone to link up with uh, probably the OECD once again uh, and wider efforts around Tiva understand a little more of the work that's going on there uh, and, and really just collaborate and work together to, to come to a, a sort of more global uh, solution if possible there. Thanks for that Luke. Um, I don't see any more questions coming through. Anything else from anyone before we consider closing the session? Sanjeev, uh, can I ask a question? I'm Jose. Uh, can I? Yes. So uh, I remember when we uh, were working uh, with the figure of tables that there was a big trade asymmetry between EU countries and UK on uh, between Luxembourg and UK on financial services. So I was wondering whether you have faced uh, that problem, or you have identified, or if there is any news about uh, about this uh, progress of trying to to know what, what what's happening. Thank you. Yeah. Again, thank you for the question. Um, so with Luxembourg, you're right. Um, you know, in terms of uh, financial services, comprise a large part of our asymmetry, uh, both on the export and import side with Luxembourg. It's something that we haven't yet looked at in more detail. I would certainly hope that, again, in, in the near term, we start looking a little bit more at financial services, given their importance to the to the UK economy. So at the moment, unfortunately, I, I don't have a sort of more definitive answer, though I'd love to be able to give that to you. But it's something that you certainly want to look at in, in the relatively uh, near future. Okay, thanks for that, Luke. Yeah, it's a good question, Jose. Um, I think on financial services, there's going to be more issues about uh, the measurement approaches, possibly compared to just the coverage. Whereas when Luke has said that issue X, Y, and Z is not included in the US account, and A, B, and C is, in, is not included in the UK account, you can actually tackle those in a different way. But I think in financial services, it won't be just those issues. It will also be how they've been measured and um, so there's a slight, I think there's a bigger challenge on the services, but you're right to raise the issue that the amounts are big and certain countries' relationships, the asymmetry is quite significant. Okay, I will Can now I ask one the same question. Same thing. Nori? Yeah. Yes, go ahead then. You have the prerogative of the uh, last question. Yeah, one minute. Uh, so um, I couldn't write uh, questions to the chat. So in the uh, comp trade, uh, USA and the Puerto Rico are merged uh, in the goods trade uh, database. Uh, obviously, national accounts not. Uh, is there similar issues of a territory difference in trading services such as Caribbean islands as they sometimes included in US, UK, and how it's uh, Thank you very much for that, Nori. Okay, I'll bring this session now to a close. If you want to continue any discussions, the, you have the chat room and you can also have dialogue immediately with the presenters. Otherwise, uh, have a good day and have a, rest, a good rest of the conference and weekend coming. Thank you very much. Au revoir.